its nerves. All right, we're ready to start. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Barbara Freire. I'm the EGU Media and Communications Manager. Welcome to our third press conference today, which is on monitoring the Earth from space. Uh, we will open the floor for questions from journalists in the room following presentations <laughs> from our speakers. And taking part in this press conference, we have Cornelio Zenf, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, Austria. Then we have Francesco Caso, who is a researcher at the Institute for Electromagnetic Sensing of the Environment. And this is part of the National Research Council of Italy, and, this, and he's based in Naples. Then we have Lauren Biermann, who is an Earth Observation Scientist at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK. And finally, we have Torsten Neubert, who is a principal investigator of the ASIM mission. And ASIM stands for Atmosphere Space Interactions Monitor. And he's a chief consultant at the Technical University of Denmark, uh, DTU Space in, in Denmark. I will now hand over to our speakers. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So my name is Cornelius Senf. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Natural Resources and Life Sciences here in Vienna. And I'm going to talk about how to use satellite data to monitor forest resources in uh, Europe. And I want to start showing the media some media outlets from the past two years, um, which highlighted that forests are changing. So there's wind, um, there uh, has been fire, a lot of fire in the past years, um, and there's been bark beetle. And um, people get really um, emotional about this topic. But um, actually, we do not have data on that. We do not know how forest and forest disturbances are changing across Europe. And our solution is to use um, satellite data to actually monitor forests across Europe. And we use one particular satellite family, and that's the Landsat family. And that's the longest running civilian Earth observation mission in space. It started in the 70s. It's still running, and it's continued to running um, with Landsat 9 in 2020. So it's a unique data set to monitor forest changes. So we applied this Landsat satellite data to Europe, and I want to jump directly into the results. And one of the major results we have so far, so this is preliminary results, it's not published yet, um, but we have a lot of data analyzed already, is that forest disturbances are consistently increasing across Europe. And what you see here, each of those lines is um, the annual forest disturbance rate, so it's the annual rate of forests that are, so to say, dying in European forests for up to now 26 countries out of 35 we're going to analyze in total over the years 84 to 2018. And most of those lines are actually going up, so forest disturbances are going up. And if you calculate something like a median or ma like average trend from this, you can see that forest disturbance rate has changed by approximately 1.5% 1, 1 per year. To put this number into perspective, um, this means that in the mid-80s, roughly 0.6% of the forest area were disturbed per year. It's up to 1% per year now, still abstract numbers. So putting this into perspective again, it's going up from 12,600 uh, 12, square kilometers per year up to 21,000 square kilometers per year. And that's roughly the area of Slovenia. So the area, the area, the land area of Slovenia is dying every year in European forests by 2080. So remote sensing is not only about estimating trends, but it's also about mapping things. And this is the first high resolution and long-term forest change map for Europe. It's only for six countries by now, but will be extended to the rest of Europe. And each of those little red dots you see here is a forest that has been dying in the past 30 years. And I want to um, jump in into three case studies where you can kind of see what drives recent changes in forest disturbances. One is the Storm Kirill 2007 in Germany. One is Storm and Bark Beetle disturbances in Slovakia. And one is pine plantations in Poland. So the first case, this is the uh, Sauerland region in Western Germany. It's a mid-elevation mountain range. And all those red patches are, again, forest disturbances happening in 2007. So roughly 30% of the landscape, of the forest in the landscape, have been disturbed in one single event in one single year in 2007, one of the largest storms we had. And those storms are really clustering in the past 10 years. The second example I want to bring is, again, a storm. The major mountain chain you see in the middle, it's the High Tatra Mountains on the border of Slovakia and Poland. There's been a huge windstorm in 2004. It's the largest windstorm we ever recorded for Europe. 
And there was a lot of dead wood lying around, which facilitates bark beetle development. So bark beetles spread in the surrounding forests, creating this kind of mess we see here. So it's very patchy, very complex forest disturbances as a result of wind and bark beetle disturbances. So it seems like natural disturbances are increasing across Europe. But I want to show you a little different example. Um, this looks quite similar, but it has completely different reasons. Those are high productive palm plantations in Poland. Those were planted after World War II. They're now an age where they get susceptible to humans. Humans like to create timber from forests, so they cut those trees. And in fact, the larger, largest disturbance patches and the most intensive disturbances we find in those high productive pine plantations. And maybe you see this very large and huge red patch in the middle. This is not an error. This is open pit mining. So forests were cleared for open pit mining. And if you followed the discussion in Germany last year, um, this is, I think, a nice example to show. So um, summing up the key messages so far from this project, so Lancet remote sensing, optical remote sensing over very long time spans allows for reconstructing more than 30 years of forest disturbances, which is from an ecological perspective unique. Um, forest disturbances are consistently increasing across Europe due to increasing timber harvest and natural disturbances. And those increases are driven both by changing forest structure and climate change. We can't infer this from those data, but we have good evidence from local case studies supporting this interpretation. And given that forests are still changing, biomass is accumulating, climate change is going on, we expect future increases. And if you look at northern Italy, huge windstorm last October, now it's again very dry, very hot. This probably will be a hot spot for forest disturbances in the upcoming years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is, is Francesco Casu. I'm uh, from uh, an institute of the uh, National Research Council of Italy. It is called uh, Institute for the Electromagnetic Sensing of Environment. And we work with the satellite data for detecting the ground deformation. I'm re here representing uh, uh, my group uh, that is uh, listed here. And uh, uh, our institute is uh, devoted to support the, the civil protection department in Italy. What we do with this uh, technique uh, using satellite data is to monitor the deformation of uh, the ground deformation of the main Italian volcanoes, like the Campi Flegre, Vesuvius, Mount Etna, and many more. And also to have a quick uh, to, to give a quick response uh, to the civil protection during uh, um, emergency phases like the earthquakes. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, can happen in Italy since it is a very seismic region, uh, like the one uh, happened in Amatrice uh, during the 2016. So the technique that we apply is based on the acquisition of the, uh, of the images from the Sentinel-1 data of the Copernicus program. We downloaded the data and we processed them with our uh, interferometric SAR technique that is called PISBAS. And we generated the deformation time series per every pixel that can be um, analyzed. And then, uh, since we can benefit of the continuous acquisition of the satellites, in particular of the Sentinel-1, we can uh, take every six days, it is the repeat pass of the Sentinel, we can take every six days a new acquisition and we can do an update of the time series every time a new acquisition is, uh, is present. So in this way, we do a sort of monitoring of the deformation of the volcano. Uh, after that, we provide the, the, the information to the civil protection department uh, on a monthly basis for uh, giving them uh, an update on the, on the status of the deformation of the, of the volcanoes that we monitor. And now I show you some examples. This is, for instance, the Campi Flegre Caldera, and this is the deformation uh, uh, that you can retrieve since uh, the 2015. On, uh, on your left, you can see the vertical deformation, and you can measure an exp the, 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 the caldera experience an uplift of uh, more or less 25 millimeters starting from March 2015. And this means that the caldera is uplifting uh, uh, in such a way uh, so that uh, uh, there is a sort of uh, uplifting movement that we monthly report to the Civil Protection Department. Um, 
Again, uh, we monitor also the Mount Etna. This is the, the main deformation of the Mount Etna. The colors means, in this case, that the mean deformation velocity up to the end of 2018. And here you can see some of the key deformation that we monitored. You can see that there are jumps in the time series. Uh, this due to the last summit eruption that occurred in the December of the last year. And we were able to monitor this jump, and we uh, quickly provided information to the civil protection on this respect uh, for, uh, for studying, oh, for sure, together with other uh, research centers in Italy that, are, uh, that works for the civil protection. So we were able to give them information about the amount of deformation that occurred uh, during the, the eruption. Uh, Italy is full of... Um, of active volcano. This is another case, Stromboli Island. This is the Shara del Fuoco that is also experienced a long-term subsidence of the whole flank of the volcano that could be uh, risky because uh, the people uh, live there. And uh, um, so the, the, the point is that we have to monitor uh, the deformation that is uh, going on there. Uh, so this is scalable up and uh, this is um, project that we have for the uh, Ministry of the Develop and, Econo uh, Develop and Economy in Italy. So this is the story that I told you. These are the, the volcanoes that I show you, but the story, as you can see, is uh, much bigger. And uh, you can see different de kind of deformation uh, all over the Italy. For instance, aquifer deformation, like in the Pistoia one, where you can see the seasonal deformation due to the exploitation of the aquifer. You can catch uh, the deformation induced by the earthquakes, as in the Amatrice area uh, that uh, affected the, the central Italy part. And also, you can monitor the, the landslides. So this is our uh, activities. and. Uh, um, I think that I thank you for your uh, attention on, on my presentation. Okay, um, I apologize, um, my voice is struggling. So I'm Lauren Beerman, and I've been working with Victor Martinez Vicente on a European Space Agency funded project called Optimal. And we've been working towards a method for detecting macroplastics using data collected by satellites. Now, when I talk about macroplastics, I am also talking about microplastics, because any marine litter that makes it from a typical riverine system into coastal waters is inevitably going to be largely exported to the open ocean, where it is free to do nefarious things, like become entangled with charismatic megafauna or become ingested. Um, but inevitably and eventually, the macroplastics are going to break down into microplastics and start to contribute to the global load. So really, by understanding macroplastics, I'm trying to answer questions about trends, fates, and pathways relating to microplastics. But if you want to do that by satellite, you have a very small window of opportunity around here. And that is because as soon as it enters the open ocean, the um, plastics are going to become much harder to detect, and they're going to become essentially invisible to satellite sensors. Now, satellites are not routinely used to monitor macroplastics or microplastics in the marine environment. Um, limiting factors include temporal and spatial resolution, as well as environmental factors. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with remote sensing data, but I can't see through cloud, and the world is pretty cloudy. So that is a very significant limiting factor. But I have at my disposal Sentinel 2A and B. Now these are satellites that are owned by Copernicus and operated by the European Space Agency. And they were launched in 2000 and 2015 and 17 respectively. So that's quite new. They are terrestrial satellites, but of course, um, by, by monitoring the, the, the terrestrial environment it automatically collects data over the coastal environment as well. And so that means that I get data every two to five days at 10 meter spatial resolution in the coastal zone. And at that kind of resolution, I can detect things like aquaculture cages and small boats. But even at that resolution, I'm never gonna be able to detect one small floating plastic bottle. So I'm reliant on sub-mesoscale features. These are just fronts and plumes that exist in the coastal zone, which are known to aggregate these sorts of materials. 
Now this is a video that was kindly shared by H. Fisk Johnson and I think it's really brilliant at illustrating the kind of thing that I'm looking at from space. So this is a front and you can see the material has been aggregated. You see how it's been nicely aggregated at the surface. But what else do you notice? The majority of that aggregation is plant material. So you can see those bright white spots that are the plastics and the majority of plant material. Now if we imagine that Professor Fisk Johnson is about six foot in fins, that's about the size of a Sentinel-2 pixel. So what do you see in there? The bright white objects that are plastics, the plant material, and what else? The water itself. So you've got three variables per pixel and you're trying to determine macroplastics. It's not a very straightforward thing. But fortunately, Sentinel-2 has a number of bands that we can leverage to try and unmix these pixels. So using information on the fact that water absorbs really strongly in the near infrared, and we shouldn't see a signal there unless something's floating on the water, and the fact that plant material absorbs strongly in the red, we can start to leverage these bands to unmix the pixels. So at Plymouth Marine Labs, we've developed a floating debris index, and we examine that against a very basic vegetation index to say, okay, how much of the pixel is plant and how much of it is not plant? The best way to do that, of course, is to have a perfect example in the world of what 100% plant material looks like. So we went to Barbados, by satellite, unfortunately, and we looked at what 100% plant material looks like. Now, sargassum is widespread. These rafts can be up to seven meters deep. We're very certain that we have 100% plant material in the pixel. And then we compared it against what 100% plastic looks like, where we have three whole pixels in the world, where we are certain that we have plastic, thanks to the University of the Aegean. The Marine Remote Sensing Group last year put out three targets. One was composed of blue plastic bags. We have a few issues there. It was a bit close to land, and some of it was sunk. We also have their ghost netting. It's orange nylon fishing nets. Again, though, there was some of it that was sunk. So we have one perfect pixel, which was clear water bottles. And from this, we were able to say, what does plastic look like in the marine environment and what do plant materials look like? So when I take those bands of Sentinel-2 and I plot them spectrally, what you see there is water, plant material, and plastic. So yellow, you see the plastic there. You see that peak in the near infrared, whereas water absorbs. And plant material, you also see that peak. But can you see the difference in the red and the red edge? That RE stands for red edge. There are distinct differences that we can then use to determine what is what. The other thing that we did is then we plotted the debris, the floating debris index against the vegetation index. And from this, we could make a reference model to say, this is where we expect plastic to fall, and this is where we expect vegetation to fall. So we threw this at some case studies. The first site is where I studied, the east coast of Scotland. I studied at St Andrews. Um, There's a lot of work done at the Isle of May. And um, the Marine Conservation Society released a report last year on Twitter and showed that across 135 Scottish beaches, which are, I think of Scotland as quite pristine, um, there was increase in plastic pollution by up to 14% over the last few years. Now, I don't have validation data over that time, but my colleague Matt ID Carter shared some pictures um, from the Firth, where we were, studying, uh, we were studying seals, and plastic is everywhere. It's pervasive. It's in the nests, and it's, and it's where these young pups are being born. When I, plot, when I plotted some pixels that I found that looked like plastic, this is what we got spectrally. Uh, you can see that nice pink peak in the near infrared. And when we apply our reference model, surprisingly what we see, even though this coastline has got a lot of macroplastic, we actually see that According to our reference model, a lot of these pixels seem to be dominated by non-vegetation floating material, which is likely to be plastics based on um, reports. The other site we looked at on the other side of the world was in Washington State, um, BC. We looked at the RV litter base portal and found a really great paper by Davis and Murphy. They showed that the San Juan Islands had high concentrations of floating litter. So we focused around Gabriola Island. It's located near a busy marina. But more importantly, in situ data, high resolution um, imagery from Google Earth and planets showed that there were persistent features, persistent submesoscale fronts that were aggregating materials. When we look at our pixels based on our floating debris index and our vegetation index, again, you see that really nice peak in the near infrared. And according to our reference model, we have some things that are floating that are not vegetation. But actually, the waters around here are really complicated, and it might just be that I'm 
that I'm picking up jellyfish, and I have no way of knowing without better in situ validation data. But there is evidence to show that the pixels that we're seeing are not necessarily composed of vegetation. Now, we've only been working on this for five months, but we're already showing some really exciting results. I think it's clear to say that Sentinel-2, even on subpixel scales, is picking up aggregations that are likely to include macroplastics. Our, um, our floating debris index is helping us move away from vegetation indices that are more common, so we can start to unmix pixels. But I can't say this strongly enough, there is uncertainty because we do not have enough validation data that's been collected in situ. I'm going to be doing more work on the atmospheric correction as soon as we get some funding for this work again, and um, of course, unmixing the pixels to determine composition. I have a lot of people to thank. NERC got me here, and of course, the European <coughs> Space Agency funded the first few months of this research, and of course, to Ollie Clements and the rest of the Plymouth Marine um, group who've helped me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. My name is Thorsten Albert. That's not the first slide, is it? That is not the start, is there it? There we yeah. go. Yeah. Um, I'm going to present the Atmosphere Space Interactions Monitor, where we look at thunderstorms. It's a payload that was launched uh, last year, uh, 2nd of April, to the International Space Station. We have groups uh, in the project that are in Denmark, Valencia, Spain, Bergen, Norway, and then, uh, of course, Estec, Holland, and also CERA in France. Okay, so let me... Um, not that one. Not that not one. That one. <laughs> Which one? Post it? Uh, the video? Oh, you've got... No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, I can do it. I can yeah. do it. <coughs> but where is it? Uh, nine kilohertz. Where's nine kilohertz? Is it this one down here? Oh, seven, seven kilohertz. Here we go. Yeah, down there. Okay, so let me just introduce you to lightning. Uh, you, we, we all think we know what lightning is, but he, here's, a, here's a video that is taken at 7,000 frames per second and played back in normal time. And you think, see things that you don't see with your naked eye. Okay, so the reason why I show this video is that we really don't understand what goes on inside lightning. These new uh, cameras, they, they allow us to get a peek inside. Um, but we have the problem with the very fast time scales and also that they come from clouds and we can't look inside clouds. So, if we go back to the presentation and Yeah, thanks. Give me the next slide. Can you? Oh, no. Yes, please. <laughs> Which one is still still? This one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it crashes. Crashing. Crashing. Start from slide three. Just click on slide three and then start. Right. Right. Okay. Sorry about that. Well, so, um, the last uh, 10 or 20 years, we've discovered uh, a bunch of new things above thunderstorms. Now, um, if you look here on the left, you have the altitude scale, 0 to 100 kilometers. So, down below here, we have normal lightning that you know, the thunderstorms cloud, clouds here and lightning, and above them you see lightning going the wrong way, if you will. They're going upwards. Some of them are reaching all the way up to 80 kilometers, up to the ionosphere here. They have different names, and maybe you've met some of them. The red sprites, blue jets, gigantic jets. And then there's the terrestrial gamma ray flashes, with huge energy that is squirted out from the thunderstorms. These are the elements that ASIM is looking at. Okay. And they are just lightning in a different environment, up high in the atmosphere where the density is very low. So everything happens slower and is very much larger. But it's the element of lightning that we're actually looking at 
just under different conditions. So they allow us to, to look inside what, in, in a sense, what is lightning, uh, what is goes on in lightning. What I'm going to talk about is particularly the terrestrial gamma ray flashes and some of the blue stuff that goes on at the top of lightning clouds. I seem to be going the wrong way. Oh, it's crashing every time I get to this slide here. Well, one of the points I'm going to make is that the payload that we are, the instruments that we put up there, they're working really well. It's working really well, much better than the system that you see here, okay? <laughs> I mean, we have not had to start over again any, at any point in time. Okay, so, um, so the three good reasons we think that we should uh, do the research we're doing. One thing is that, well, these are natural phenomena and we should know what they, what they are, you know. The second is that they allow us to get a peek inside lightning processes. So in a sense, we get the anatomy of lightning. So I've illustrated an atomic atlas here. Just imagine if you don't see a person from the outside, if you open it up, look at all this fantastic stuff that's going on inside. This is how we look at what we're doing. Now, we also need to have a peek inside to understand how lightning is affecting the climate, how it's affecting the chemistry, for example, and how thunderstorms interact in general with the atmosphere. Now, which part should I press? I'm, I'm scared for you, so let's just do that. I don't yeah, to touch it. Yeah. So, so here's a payload, and it's a, it's one by one meters approximately, uh, one by one by one, <coughs> and the huge uh, foily thing is not a cheese. It's an X and gamma ray detector. Okay. Uh, it's a main instrument, and then next to it you see an assembly of three photometers and two cameras that look at uh, lightning at various wavelengths. And here's ASIM on the space station. Um, we are mounted on the ESA Columbus module um, and we are looking downwards because we need to be as close as we can to the TGF sources, so we look straight down. And on the right you see the uh, X and gamma ray detector. It's, let me see, it's this one here, looking down. And here you see the optical uh, cameras and photometers also looking down. Yeah. So, the main point I want to get across here is that uh, we can now pinpoint uh, uh, what lightning process uh, generates TGFs. This is something that's been debated for many years. TGFs were uh, observed by chance in 1993 by an astronomical type satellite with, ca with uh, detectors looking into cosmos. But they saw funny stuff every time they passed over thunderstorms. But uh, how, how, how are they really generated? That's, uh, there's not really, we're not really home there yet, but this is what ASIM will address and what we think we, we have an answer to. I can't say too much about the specifics here because there's an embargo on it from a journal where we have a paper for consideration. Now, the second point I want to make is uh, we see surprisingly amount of activity on top of thunderstorms, especially in the blue, uh, blue region. It's like, uh, it's like uh, New Year's Eve with uh, lightning uh, simulating, let's say, rockets being launched at New Year's Eve, and then they come ab above the thunderstorms and explode up there. It's really a fantastic display of light uh, above the thunderstorms, from the top of the clouds and above. And then um, I want to mention that Andreas Mogensen was the first Danish astronaut who was up there for a couple of years ago. And he took some very, very interesting data that uh, I'll return to, which are very important for us today to interpret our, our own data, ASIM data. And then finally, of course, as I said before, our instruments, they work extremely well. Yeah. So uh, let's go to the gamma ray flashes. It's, thunderstorms are, are nature's most powerful, well, not powerful, it generates the most energetic radiation uh, naturally, natural radiation. Uh, photons reach 40 MeV energies and above. And if you think about uh, what is required when you go to the dentist, then uh, it's a thousand times higher energies that, you, that what you get there. The bursts are very short though, 100 microseconds or just a fraction of a millisecond. And we know that they accelerate in thunderstorm electric fields and they're bremsstrahlung. It's the electrons that are accelerated. There's lots of electrons in lightning. That's the, the, the ones that 
carry the current. And they accelerate with very high energies, and then um, they're generating bremsstrahl. But then there's the point about the acceleration mechanism that we now think we can address. Yeah. So here's a simulation. Should we try it if it works? Let's give it a bash. <laughs> okay, which one? It is TGF Sim Video TGF. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Big screen, big. This is a simulation. I mean, it's hard to visualize what a TGF looks like, but here we, we've tried. So there's a process that accelerates photons that are injected upwards up uh, in the atmosphere, and up there on the space station is ASIM with its instrument and measuring this uh, burst of gamma rays. So we are, of course, measuring just a little, little part of all these photons that are emitted upwards. What I can say about the TGF, though, is that from our observations, we can see that we, we have the most sensitive instrument in space that's been up to date. We are four times better than the best there is right now. And we see a TGF every day, basically. And we see TGF that is not just a single pulse, but they puff several pulses in a row. Um, we are the first that can directly identify where these, uh, this radiation is coming from. We couldn't do that in the past. But now with our instrument, we can point to the cloud from where the radiation is coming directly from our measurement. We are the first instrument that can actually make the sequence of optical UV and uh, X-ray radiation, which allows us um, to tell how is lightning and TGFs uh, related, which is what we have this paper about. So that is, I think, what I can say for right now about the TGFs. Yeah. If you go to the blue lightning with Andreas Mogensen, um, there are glimpses and jets at the top of clouds reaching uh, the tropopause across and into the stratosphere. They're pure, poorly characterized because um, it's hard to do a, a measurement at the top of clouds. Um, ASIM shows that it's uh, during maximum uh, punch of the cloud as it's puffed upwards that, uh, that you see these things. And then we think that TGFs and blue lightning uh, might be related. And here's just some measurements that we see from our cameras the red on the left and the blue on the right, and we see the structure of the clouds and the light peeking through the structures, yeah? And uh, if we try this, it should work, shouldn't it? No? Um, no. No? Okay. This, this is video blue lightning, yeah. Try that one. No, no, I think it's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah we were lucky. Okay, so, so the the total field of view is a black box. We are looking from a space station down on, on uh, northern Australia. And the red box is uh, the cropped images that we get from the cameras. And here we have taken the blue camera. We pass over the thunderstorm and see a lot of you know, blue lightning in the top of the clouds. And uh, here's a photometer that has very high sampling rate. And uh, between the big, the vertical black uh, lines there is a one frame, it's a twelfth of a second, and then we see different colors, the blue, the 337 nanometer, and the red, those are the ones you should look at, that's uh, the red one. The red one we know is lightning, it's a real lightning, and the blue is uh, stuff related to lightning. And normally the red is larger than the blue, but uh, in these kinds of events it's the opposite. So. It's fantastic if you if you got good blue eyesight, it's <laughs> you could see it. I think 337 is just at the limit. If we take ratio of images, we'll see that uh, uh, where it's blue, well, blue is really strong. Where we show it red, that's a normal lightning. So lots of blue activity going up uh, on top of the clouds next. So. We can't, of course, see how, how high these emissions are because uh, we are looking straight down. But we know more or less how to interpret it. Um, and here's one example we, we can get some help from. That's Andreas Mohnsen on the ISS that took Im images of the storm that you see on the top uh, left, the cloud, cloud protruding up, and pulses of uh, blue jets uh, coming up. And this is normal frame rate. I think it's 40 frames per second, so a lot of activity uh, 
going out on the top of the cloud. Now, the scale here, you should notice, is maybe 20, 30, 30, 40 kilometers that this blue thing is shooting upward. So it's way into the stratosphere. Yeah. So just to remind you the main points, we think we can pinpoint the lightning process that generate TGF. We think surpri there's surprisingly high levels of blue lightning. And the uh, astronaut observations were really valuable. And we have the first instrument designed to measure TGFs and TLEs in space, and it works extremely well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentations. I should say that there's a model of ASIM just outside the press conference room, if you want to have a look. But for now, we have time for a couple of questions. Are there any questions from the journalists in the room? Yeah, so one of the um, initial points of the project was to see um, what could be done with Sentinel-2 resolution, but also to inform future missions. So what can we get out of Sentinel-2 as it stands, and what would we prefer in the future if we were going to specifically look for floating debris? Um, and so it was it was really just um, a, a blue sky test of what we could do. I mean, the spectral bands are very finessed, obviously. Massively. So planet um, data, as much as the resolution is, is preferred, um, they don't have shortwave infrared bands, for example. They don't have the red edge bands, and that's not unique to Sentinel-2, but it's certainly a selling point for me. Um, there's a lot of information in those bands that are not just the near-infrared bands, which I can leverage from Sentinel-2, but very few other satellites offer that. And a quick one for you, Torsten. The, yeah. um, Europe's next generation Metiosat satellite is that going to be of any use to you? I think maybe it's the other way around, uh, that we can be used for them, and we are actually collaborating with them. Um, you're referring to the lightning imager that they're going to have on board. It's the first time Europe can measure lightning from a geostationary uh, distance, which is quite a feat. Um, but how to interpret the data? They're looking at uh, one of the same bands that we also use, the 777, a lightning band. But we have, of course, uh, we, we are research satellites, so, so it's kind of by chance which thunderstorms that we measure. But on the other hand, when we measure them, we have very high resolution, much higher than METOSAT will have, uh, MTG will have. So we are collaborating with them so they can learn from, uh, from some of the, um, the conclusions that we get. Yeah. Are there any additional questions? Uh, it's uh, Adam Vaughan from New Scientist. Uh, Cornelius, I just wanted to ask about uh, how does your how does your the rate of loss that you know you've got this quite striking you know s sort of stat of you know one Slovenia every year. How does that compare to other sort of ways of looking you know other ways of studying this forest loss? How does your satellite record compare to other models? Yeah, so the numbers seem very high. So what we look at is the canopy. So we also call it canopy disturbance. And um, this is not to be confused, which, which is kind of the stem-based disturbance rates you know from classic ecology. So we are looking at the area, and this is um, really higher. What we find for um, Central Europe, at least, is that the area-based disturbance rates are going up. The stem-based disturbance rates are going down. And there's only one explanation for this. It's a very simple silvicultural explanation that it's bigger and larger trees which are dying. So you have fewer trees but larger areas. So in the end, it's the more biomass storing trees which are dying. And this fits what we know for European forests, which are accumulating biomass um, quite rapidly over the last decades. Are there any additional questions? If not, we'll finish here. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for your talks. You're welcome to approach our speakers after the end of this press conference and book one of the interview rooms available. And our next press conference is coming up at 2, and it's on the 2018 heat wave and new research on European climate. Thank you very much for your talks. Thank, Thank you. you.